Hello, and welcome to my review of the Infernal City, an Elder Scrolls novel by Greg Keyes. Before we get into this review, I will point out that while I play Elder Scrolls Online, that's me getting killed behind me on the screen, I have not played any of the other Elder Scrolls games, and am by no means an expert on the vast lore that comes with the series. But as this is my first foray into the wider Elder Scrolls universe, I was quite intrigued by it going in. But it's worth also mentioning that I'm not a particular fan of movie or game tie-ins, with the exception of Brian Daly's Han Solo or possibly Timothy Zahn's Heir to the Empire series. I think I'd be hard-pressed to recommend anything that I've read before. And even then, I don't think I would recommend it that highly. But Greg Keyes has carved himself out a bit of a niche as a sort of go-to guy in the tie-in world. And he's written for the Babylon 5 and Star Wars expanded universes, as well as tie-ins for the Planet of the Apes and Independence Day series. So while I'm not familiar with his work, it did seem encouraging. In the modern fantasy world, a 290 page novel is a pretty rare thing. I use my Game of Thrones novels, for example, to prop up my car when I'm changing a wheel. And with that in mind, it'll be a little surprise to you that this is only half a novel, with a sequel, Lord of Souls, also available. So with that said, it's hardly surprising that the plot here exists only in part and is designed to set up the sequel and introduce the characters and not do much else. It's not completely uninteresting, nor is it particularly poor. It's just that it's all a bit samey and it's all a bit seen at all before. I do kind of feel that fantasy in general has reached this point where it's all been done before and we're treading water waiting for the next big thing. It's probably why I enjoyed Game of Thrones more for its political aspects than the battles and more fantastical elements. An example I'd use here is the floating city, a device that was used in Gulliver's Travels as far back as the 1700s and regularly crops up in science fiction and fantasy in more modern times. Additionally, what is there left for a villain to do that hasn't been done before? Keyes' bad guys compete to see whose chefs can come up with the most whimsical way for them to devour souls. And I can't help but feel that this was a bit of a misjudgment for, for two reasons. One, his main character ends up working in one of these kitchens quite ably. The phrase Keyes uses is, she's like a butcher getting used to blood. Well, I think you can't really use eating souls to show how wicked your bad guys are when you have your hero providing the 48 course meal to them. It certainly reflects quite badly on your protagonist when you do. You could save this by having a really strong good guy turning bad story, but that's not really the case here. The second issue is that the inter-kitchen politics, while violent, never seriously carry a convincing threat to an egg, the hero who gets embroiled in it. Instead, it begins to feel a little bit like filler. The story surrounding the Imperial Prince Atrobus is slightly more interesting. The reveal that many of his glories were not quite what they seemed was quite interesting, but the long walks between encounters, not so much, though I will admit I've read far worse. On this evidence, it's easy to see why Keyes has the track record he does. He's a competent writer, perhaps a little bit more. But the sentence on screen here should never appear in print in any novel ever. Additionally, his characters resort to the standard devices that writers use to create a sense of mystery when there really isn't one. Lines such as, I'll tell you when you need to know. I need you to come along. Why? Because I do. And he even uses the classic bad guy cliche, I'm not even sure why I'm telling you this, but... Well, it's because it's the plot, Mr. Bad Guy, and we kind of need to know that stuff. Several times, Keyes uses depends to mean hanging, which is a really old definition. I'm not sure why, but it really jumped out at me. I assumed he was using it to try and evoke a sense of classical or archaic history. But at other points, his use of more modern phraseology in both narration and dialogue rather undermines this. Overall, I'd say it is possible to enjoy this novel without an in-depth knowledge of the Elder Scrolls lore but those with a touch of nostalgia for the stories and places in the games will probably get more out of it. For example, when a character exclaims, Stendhal's ghost, it's not essential to know who Stendhal is to understand the point that's being made. If that's a spoiler, I apologise and attribute it to my lack of Elder Scrolls knowledge. I'd recommend this to Elder Scrolls fans who are not particularly big fantasy readers, because if they are, they'll find little new here. If you're a big Elder Scrolls Online or Morrowind fan, then this will give you something to feed your addiction while you're away from your computer. And it does follow on from Morrowind to the game if that helps you identify which part of the Elder Scrolls timeline it belongs in. As to the sequel Lord of Souls, if I can find a copy in a second-hand bookshop or a sale, I might check it out, but I probably wouldn't pay full price. Hopefully that helps you decide if it's worth investing your time and money in The Infernal City by Greg Keyes. Perhaps if I've saved you some time, you'll spend it checking out the other videos on my channel, and I'll see you in the next one.